Um, so without further um, chit chat, I will hand it over to Livio. Okay, thanks, perfect. Let me share my screen. And please confirm, Mirella, if you can see it. Yep, uh, everything looks great. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to presentation mode and I will start. So hi everyone, thanks for being here and for listening to us today. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, B2B product management and I'm gonna talk about what makes it unique. So this should be interesting for people that are entering product or that are entering B2B product management so they know what to expect. And hopefully also for people that are already in B2B product, they can, they can see something that they know and um, please then uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We're gonna have a Q and A session at the, at the end of each talk. So a few words about me uh, before we start. So my name is Livio, I am Italian, I come from Sardinia. I live in Berlin since some years now. And um, I'm currently working at AirHelp. I will tell you a bit more in just a second. Um, a few words about me, education. So I, I have a business degree. I studied in Leeds, United Kingdom, and I just finished um, a master in growth at Reforge, which is an interesting course uh, from Silicon Valley. It talks about how to do growth in product and marketing. I started working in venture capital. Uh, so I was working with startups uh, and for startups, for, uh, mostly coming from a um, financial and business modeling perspective. And then, and, and focusing on early stage. And since I moved to Berlin, I work actually in growth stage companies. I work in e-commerce for some time. And now I'm working at AirHelp since uh, beginning of last year. And at AirHelp, uh, I've been uh, leading the B2B product team. Um, and that's where I got most of the uh, insights that I will share with you today. Um, just a few words about AirHelp. AirHelp is, um, um, global leader in a flight compensation space. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, essentially, it helps you get money back if your flight is canceled or if your flight is delayed and is the airline's fault. So no COVID. And um, B2B, uh, what does B2B do in this context? So we work with online travel agencies that, sells, that sell tickets online. And in case their uh, passengers are, and their clients are delayed, uh, their flight is delayed or canceled, we help them get, um, get the money from the airline. But um, today I'm not officially representing the help. I'm not here to talk about uh, my job at their help, but rather to talk about what, what I learned and, and that's what I'm gonna share with you. So let's start from the very basic. This is very basic, but it's important because I use it as a framework to then explain what is B2B product management. So this is what the book says, say product management is. So usual Venn diagram, UX on the one hand, so UX design, tech on the other, and business on, on the other hand. There is no difference in B2B product management. I mean, the circles are the same, but um, there are obviously peculiarities that I'm gonna go through. Um, this is what books say. Uh, this is more uh, how I see B2B product management. Uh, so in reality, yeah, three circles through, through. The reality is that I feel more like I felt when I was doing it, um, more like an octopus that have to take inputs from one side, push, push them in the other, try to align priority, try to create something that works. That's, that's true for any product management job. But when you work with uh, companies, the level of complexity is normally higher. Um, and I'm gonna explain that in just a sec. So from a very high level perspective, so what does B2B product, B2B means, means business to business. So B2B product management is uh, in the context in which your client, so the end client of your product is, is a business. Um, and I think we can, on principle, have three types of B2B products. One case is when the business is your company. So this is typically an internal tool that you build for your own company. For instance, at AirHelp, we manage claims of people that want to get money back from the airline and we do it with an internal tool. So the client is business, it's a company and it's your own company. 
Then we have another case in which the actual end customer is a company. So the B of B2B is enterprise or is uh, SMEs. Uh, these are cases like Salesforce, HubSpot, um, software as a service product sold to companies. And then uh, on the other hand, we can have cases in which the business, so the company is actually not your end customer, but is only a channel. And through that company, you reach uh, end customers, you reach consumers. So this is typically called B2B2C. Um, and that's what we do at Air Help. But wh why I'm talking about um, B2B product now? Because I think that in, in COVID times is extremely relevant. And it's extremely re relevant for three main reasons that actually distinguish from traditional product management. One is distribution, one is funding, and one is resilience. All, all of them impacted by uh, the current disruption. So as far as the distribution is concerned, uh, B2C distributing products, so marketing products, so reaching end users in a B2C context is more and more difficult. Why? Because there is an oligopoly in the market. Google and Facebook control main acquisition channels and Amazon control the distribution of physical products. So um, in, this is not exactly the same in B2B. Obviously, you partially suffer from it. But in general, these are models that are sales driven in which you can reach your final customers also without depending too much on distribution. Then another key dis distinct dis uh, difference is funding. So in B2C, you need a lot of funding. You need a lot of money. Why? Because you typically have products that are, have a low, very low conversion or very low uh, average value per user. As a consequence, you need to have a lot of users in order to convert a few of them. Uh, in B2B, that's different. You can typically make a lot of money out of an individual user, and you can actually bootstrap your business with limited external capital. This is even more relevant now when raising capital will be difficult. And finally, in terms of resilience, B2C products are very, very affected by the economic climate, as we can see now, while B2B products are actually more uh, predictable. So that's why I decided to talk about product, but B2B product management. But let's talk about in, in three concepts. I will go use the three pieces of the diagram to, to tell you what I believe, why I believe B2B product management is unique to then, con uh, to then uh, tell you why I think it's interesting to do it. So core, di core distinguish, very basic, is that your user, so the user, the UX of the tree circle is a business, is a company. What's the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that you have to deal with many actors. So uh, you have to deal with a lot of people within your client company, typically. So you don't only have to deal with your own stakeholder, but you have only to deal with external stakeholders. And these stakeholders are normally multiple, coming from multiple um, functions. So it can be sales, it can be, typically you start with sales, then maybe you have an implementation phase and you have uh, people that have an implementation manager, then you have the technical team of the, of the client, then you have, uh, um, well, Sometimes you have marketing, for instance. So many actors, quite difficult. Uh, second, what's the key distinguish is that is risk aversion. So as my CPO used to say, uh, as companies get big, small problems become big problems. So uh, in general, uh, companies have to preserve what they build, have to preserve jobs, people working for them, a lot of interests that are bigger and bigger as they get bigger, as a consequence, they tend to become risk adverse. Uh, this translates into the fact that you often will have to deal with legal, either internal or external. And finally, last point is that getting user feedback is particularly difficult. And this is because you don't normally talk with people that use your product, you talk to with people that buy your product. Um, very quickly, this slide. I, I actually could have used just this for this presentation. Uh, you can imagine that the small fish is you, the big fish is your client. And, and that gives you an idea of uh, um, like how, 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 how tough it can be. Um, typically, your clients are more powerful than you. And if you consider that normally in each business, 20% of clients make 80% of the revenues, well, that's even worse in B2B. 
Other specific element, let's go to the business part of the diagram. Uh, so your stakeholder is sales, that's sales. What does it mean? Well, they are salesperson, they have personal sales target, uh, and they are very good at influencing. They are very good at influencing you, and they are very good at influencing the clients. That's what they are paid for. So they are extremely pushy. Uh, that's actually interesting. You can learn a lot from them, but you need to handle it. And finally, if we're going to the tech part of the Venn diagram, uh, your product is typically highly technical. So the backend part of it is typically bigger than what users see. So it, it sometimes, uh, oftentimes materializes into customization of an existing product. So as a consequence, you depend a lot on the technical team. You need to build a lot of trust with them. Um, you need to have a strong technical leader. Um, I don't know how, how I would have done it without it in, at, at all, to be honest. And, and then consider that typically clients, uh, so businesses who are your clients, have to face implementation costs. And that means that uh, there is a cost on their side. They need to, uh, to, hire, to have uh, developers working on it. And so their decision will take time and they will pay attention not to, um, to, to do the right one. So we said tech, uh, B2B product management, it's interesting because it's more resilient in, in COVID times. Uh, your user is a company, your uh, product is typically technical, and your stakeholders are a lot and are typically sales, both internal and external. So what, is, what are the key implications of that? Well, the key, uh, there are two implications. One implication is that B2B product management is lower. It's lower because you have strong dependencies. You have strong dependencies which are internal and which are external. You depend on, uh, on your, your stakeholders. You depend on the client stakeholders. You depend on the client sales stakeholders and on the client technical stakeholders. As a consequence of that, um, the development cycles are long. They are longer in typical, of, uh, than typical B2B C product management, testing things take longer. And uh, as I was mentioning before, um, normally the client has to face implementation costs. As a consequence, uh, they, they have switching costs. So there is a potential cost for them in changing a solution. So they will take all the time that they need to select it and to make sure it's the right one. This last aspect is actually also positive because it makes the product more difficult to imitate or competitors, it's more difficult for competitors to steal your clients, but still, it makes, uh, makes the process lower. So on the one hand, it's lower. On the other hand, uh, it has a potential very high impact. So this is uh, uh, actually one of, uh, one of my favorite articles about business models uh, is uh, written by um, uh, venture capital from Berlin, and it explains you the the different five ways to build a hundred million bus uh, hundred million business in reven in yearly revenues. And in the in the axis to the in the x-axis, you have the tens of thousands of customers. So thousands of customers. So the first would be a thousand, and the last would be ten millions. And in the y-axis, you have the how much a customer pay you in a year in a given year. So if we go to the extreme right, 10 million customers that pay you 10 euros each per year, this is, more, this is typical consumer product. This is typically, you know, it's also Facebook. That's probably, Facebook, you don't pay directly, but that's more or less the average value per user that they have. So you need a lot of users that pay you not a lot. Um, on the other extreme, on the, the elephant on the, on, the top, on the top left, um, you only need a thousand customers paying hundred thousand euros each, easy to say, in order to get to the same amount. So I think that says, um, that makes a very um, easy to understand that, uh, well, B2B business are typically closer to the elephant. So are typically in the, in the, on the left part of the graph. So just by integrating a few clients, you can actually achieve a very significant impact. Um, and at the same time, what happens is that often when you, when you integrate 
uh, when you work with a new client and a new client goes live, you have uh, a um, significant portion of revenues that arrive immediately. Because oftentimes, as in our case, you're accessing the user base of your client. So, just to, just to uh, close up. So we said B2B product management, interesting in COVID times, user is a company, technical product, your stakeholder is sales, it's slow, but a lot of impact. Why would be, uh, why uh, is it interesting? Why I believe it's interesting uh, after having worked uh, some years on it? Well, for three reasons that partially have emerged from the presentation. First of all, is that you essentially, uh, either you want it or not, you become very good in influence. Uh, influence is, a, is probably the most important product management skills. Uh, often books and people focus on something else. The reality is that uh, you need to influence your clients, you need to influence your organization to lead to the most optimal impact uh, for yourself, for, not for yourself, but for yourself as product, as leader of the product and for the company. And working with people that do sales and with many people helps. Second aspect, you become very good at managing complexity. As I was saying, a lot of stakeholders, uh, different functions, uh, crazy information flows, internal, external, that's very uh, complex and can easily get chaotic. And that's actually a very good skill to have. You, you learn how to push, how to move things forward within an existing organization. And the last, which is the, my favorite one, is that once you get a client and once you do what you're supposed to do, you get very high impact of each action, typically measured in hundreds of thousands, in thousands or hundreds of thousands instead of tens of euros. And before I close up, uh, with the octopus, uh, just, uh, just three tips that helped me uh, to still survive this, this year in, in working in B2B, uh, which can seem very basic, but uh, it's actually, I think that's the core of actually uh, getting good at it. Uh, the first is uh, do not reinvent the wheel. So as we say, it, the process is lower. Uh, it takes a lot to take decision. Clients and your company tend to be risk adverse because deals are big. So once a decision is made, it's much better to build on the top of that decision rather than changing everything. So I don't know, like in our case, if, if you have a, a, a specific uh, um, email that has been approved, that has been uh, agreed with, the, with, the, with, the, with your client and uh, that has been uh, had to go through legal approvals and internal decision-making processes. Well, once it's that, once it, that email is approved, even if it's not perfect, that's most likely better to keep it and to move forward. Then the second thing is write everything down. Uh, this is very basic. I think it's a very undervalued uh, product management skills, maybe after influence. Uh, even more important now that we are all working remotely, um, it's important to write everything down, uh, down with your team, but especially with clients. Uh, you don't know how they work. People can get sick, they can go on holidays. Uh, you don't know what's, what's the politics on their side. Always better to write everything down. Common practice, this is a typically in sales, common practice and good practice, but please bear it in mind. And finally, to close up, uh, involve technical people early on. Trying to involve your technical leader, your technical people as early as possible because the product is technical. Most likely you will not understand the complexities uh, uh, of some of the things that you're, you're agreeing on uh, with, the, with the client or that you're moving forward. And you don't even want to because Unless you're coming from a technical perspective, that's probably not your strength. That's not what, you, what you're paid for it. Um, and on the other hand, which is actually something that took me longer to understand, uh, involve the technical people on the client side as early as possible. Um, again, you don't know what happens on their side. You want to push things forward. Your goal as a product manager is to have impact and to create value for your user, for your company. Well, in B2B, you do it by involving technical people early on. And, and that's it. That was the last slide. And thank you very much.
a lot. Uh, uh, so if people have questions right now, feel free to tap them in the chat and uh, we'll take it from there. Very cool uh, octopus emoji there on the ending <laughs> slide. Took you a bit to find it. Yeah, and I, I wanted to uh, stress on what you said about B2B PMs needing to be very good influencers. Uh, I've, I've had an experience that my first product role was a B2B uh, ad tech product. And, um, and then later on, I took another B2B role. And I think those helped me a lot into going into consulting afterwards. Because uh, you, you get all of this stakeholder management and all the strong sales personas and you get exposed to all of that more than in B2C where you can um, direct conversations towards let's do, uh, let's run this hypothesis, let's do uh, a user test, let's, uh, a, a, let's test this somehow to, with real people. In B2B is a lot more difficult to, uh, like you said, to reach the actual yeah. uh, consumer. Yeah, and to build on the top of it, often uh, if you have the possibility, if you have a product that sells both via B2B and via B2C, actually, if you have the possibility to do it, the best thing is to test things in B2C and then implement them in B2B. Often they are different. Sometimes it's not possible, but experimenting in B2B stuff and require agreements with the partner and also agreement all on, a, uh, on a conceptual level on what is experimenting on what is accepted, what is failure. Got it. So we have a question from uh, Victoria. Uh, Victoria is uh, joining us from uh, Munich today. Uh, what did you find the most difficult when changing from B2C to B2B? Uh, hmm. Uh, well, I Should think- I repeat from... it? Yeah, oh. yeah, no, 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 I got it. I was thinking. Uh, well, I think that probably uh, the most difficult thing is that, which is actually the biggest learning curve um, and also the most transferable skill is the possibility to manage complexity, is the capability to manage complexity. So for instance, uh, at AirHelp we work, uh, we work in across uh, four or five offices. Some people is remote. I mean, apart from now, uh, b before mm -hmm. now, uh, is uh, uh, 700 people, some is remote. The clients you don't know, so I think I had to learn uh, very quickly how to master Slack, uh, how to master different threads, uh, how to make transparency, uh, how to, um, yeah, pu push topics in, in this context, which is a mixture of uh, complexity management, in my opinion, which is more the understanding part of it, and influence management, influencing in general, which is more the active part, which is more acting on um, like actually influencing people. Cool. Uh, second uh, one is from Alicia Perez. Uh, thanks, Livio. Any recommendations, tips in how to translate business needs to technical people and technical details to sales? Well, uh, Alicia finds that very challenging. Okay, uh, let me, so first of all, let's start from the second one, how to translate technical details to sales. I think you don't have to. So I think uh, there's a reason why, why you have engineers and there's a reason why you have a product managers. And if you have people that, if someone needs technical details, need to talk either with engineer or with the product manager. Best with the engineer on the technical lead you don't want sales to be in the middle because it's not good for anyone. Um, that's my first suggestion. Uh, on the second one, like how to translate business needs to technical people. Well, that's not different than in any other type of, uh, in, than, than in, any, in another type of uh, product management. So what I normally do is uh, uh, explaining the business rationale why we are doing it, uh, explaining flows, on a very high level, so you can use diagrams. Uh, actually avoiding to go into details because sometimes it's better not to. That's why you need a lot of trust with the team. Um, and what I'm starting to do recently since some months is actually when we have a project or something, define some principles of things that we want to respect. Just to give you an example, uh, like 
quality is better than, uh, than speed, maybe for that specific client. Or uh, uh, we want to achieve, uh, uh, no, uh, we don't want to, with this implementation, we don't want to overload the customer service. Or in other cases is uh, we minimize the changes from these other clients. I tend to define these high level principles together with, uh, uh, with the, the flow and the goals because this helps people to make decisions when you're not there. And you don't want to be slacked every time there is something. Good, thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. One is from Oleksi. Do you think uh, as a software developer, uh, himself as a software developer need B2B PM skills or information uh, if he wants to grow. Can you recommend books or sources suitable for his case? So Alexi is a software developer mm -hmm. and wants to get into more B2B skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think uh, the best thing is to think uh, always of the three circles. So UX, let's say UX design, business and, um, and tech. I guess you're strong in tech. Uh, and, and that's good because normally that's what you need in B2B. Um, then the fact whether which, which circle is more important or which intersection actually depends on your company, depends on your stage. Uh, so um, you need to understand that, to understand which skills you need to develop. If it's more into design or most likely it's more into business. Uh, my suggestion is to, well, the, I will share these slides, there will be some resources on it. Uh, my suggestion in general would be is to, well, work with your product manager that is the one that knows the best. Thank you. Um, Victoria, again, uh, how uh, do you structure your workday when you need to balance your time between doing some focused work and communication with all the stakeholders? Oh, that's, that's Vic a tough one. Victoria, the you use with... Slack, but in Slack there is a very cool f feature that uh, puts you offline. Uh, I, that's how I manage it. So sometimes I just don't reply because otherwise I would spend all my time on Slack. And sometimes I can create most of the impact by being on Slack. So it depends on the phase. You definitely need to have slots in which you, you're not there for anyone, whoever he is. Even because just the fact of looking to an, for a notification is distracting you. And, uh, and, and what I used to do for finding focus, I used to have these times which, uh, like in the past, uh, I realized one day I was on the, on the plane and I realized that that's the moment in which in, in 20 minutes I got done most things that normally take me two hours. And so I tried to, repeat, to reproduce this context uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Uh, and so I have slots uh, where I lock out from everything. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's very variable. It's, it's product, so everything needs to change. Uh, so you, you need a couple of principles and then use the rules that work best for you. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, from Deepa Mani, as a B2B PM, how important is it to have good technical skills for the role? Uh, is, it could potentially be more important than in B2C, but my technical skills are not so good. What I'm very good is logic. So, and when you're good at logic, you don't need technical skills because uh, you can talk with engineers and they respect you as long as your logic is consistent. Uh, so, not technical, but logical. Thank you. Uh, so, Alexis said that he works on uh, uh, SAP hybrids. Um, he, he's the developer that had a question earlier. So now from someone called VG, can you share uh, some of the common principles that you have encountered while uh, defining your projects? Yeah, I shared some. Uh, often they are similar to what we were looking at before. So there is of quite always something about uh, this uh, uh, do not reinvent the wheel. So there is normally something about that, which is we minimize uh, variation from uh, implementation X. So in case I, I'm not there, just fall back to the standard uh, variation, to the standard implementation. And the other thing is typically going into the triangle of uh, project management. 
which is in my case is uh, it it can be that uh, speed like uh, really write it uh, right like as an equation speed greater than like uh, whatever other thing is can be uh, greater than cost so it's, it's more important to go faster than to ask for additional resources or some other time which is actually can be the case in b2b is that quality is more important than speed especially when you have to manage a lot of users or there is like you can also have contracts that have uh, penal penalties in case of failures and stuff like that thank you sounds a lot like my b2b experience <laughs> we had the delays uh, what uh, important tips or suggestions uh, you would give to someone who is starting to get into product management, be it B2B or B2C? Uh, this question is from uh, Rashem Pandit. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so you need to do, look, you need to look, uh, let, me, let me find it. So you need to look at this and understand where's your strength. So when you're starting at the very beginning, it's important to have a basic understanding of each of them. And a basic understanding of each of them, you can have it by talking with a designer, talking with an engineer, and talking with the, someone in the business that work with a product manager or work within a product team. They will give you an overview on what are the activities. And then you will start to recognize where you, find, where you see your strengths. So my suggestion if you're starting from zero is to develop some basic skills set in each of them. And uh, to then, but then the second step, which is much more important is understanding where's your strength and focus on that only. So for instance, if you look at this graph, I don't know if you see my mouse, but I'm definitely more in the conjunction between uh, uh, UX and business than uh, tech and UX, for instance, right? And so I can spend all the time that I want in improving technically, but that would gonna just make me an average product manager. Why I want to be a very good product manager in what I'm good at. That's very good. Uh, one more from Samat uh, Bosse. Uh, what are the methodologies, Scrum, Kanban, etc., and how impactful are they to your management technique and delivery? Mm -hmm. uh, so I normally default, I normally start with, uh, it's very, first of all, it's very difficult that you have, you can decide it. So if you can decide it, it means that you're joining a team that doesn't exist, which can happen. Uh, it happened to me. So assuming you can decide, um, my, my suggestion is to start from Scrum and then uh, adapt over time. So, and then diverge from Scrum as, as soon as the team start to work and you start to have feedback. Then obviously it's much more complex than that. There are contexts in which Kanban is better, depends on the stage of your company, blah, blah, blah. But if you really want to make it simple, I would suggest Scrum first and then diverge from Scrum. If you're doing Scrum by the book, uh, I think probably you're not, you're not learning from your team or, or maybe Scrum is just very good for you. Oh, thanks a lot. Um, so, so now everyone, we had this uh, also in an agenda um, and having a breakout session. So that this means that Zoom will automatically create a room with you and uh, two or three other people. Um, that will last for uh, five minutes and then everyone gets back in this main meeting room and we start a second talk with uh, Anna Maria. Uh, so we do this to recreate the um, the same vibe as you would have as a meetup where you wait by the fridge uh, or by the pizza queue and you talk with two, three other people, uh, people that are also there uh, with you. Um, so enjoy, I'm going to click some buttons and hope everything works. And you should probably get an invite. Hi, Greta, it seems it's us two in here. And uh, hi, Timo. All oh, right, record, recording restarted. Um, and over to you, Anna. Thank you, Marilla. 
So um, hello everyone and thank you for having me here. So my name is Anna and um, today I want to talk to you, I want to tell you about uh, an unconventional journey that me and, and my colleague Vlad uh, took uh, while trying to change politics in Romania, my home country. And I'm also going to share my screen so that you guys can see the presentation. So and for, said, those, uh, for those who attended Product Management Festival in Zurich, you also presented there, yes, right, yes. in 2019. Yes, yes, we, we had a presentation in the category, a different presentation. <laughs> uh, because, in fact, um, I don't have any recipe for you today on how to be a great manager. Um, I guess two things are important uh, from this presentation I want to communicate with you. Um, the first one is a message of empowerment. So um, if, um, if me and Vlad, which are like regular people, regular PMs, could, uh, could start um, and tackle a, a problem such as changing politics, I think then you can also do it. So um, I think as a PM, you have the skills to, to tackle big problems. So if you, you know, secretly wish to, to save the world, then uh, I encourage you to do so. And then the second message for you is about um, how to go about it. Um, and when we look at, at, at big problems, they, they are usually you know, representing systems which are complex and a bit stale. And so the question is how, how do we attack such system? How do we change this, 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 such systems? And um, well, the answer is like we find a hack. But in order to find out what the hack is, you actually need to, to, to follow this presentation to the end. <laughs> so at, at the end of the presentation, we're gonna talk about this fancy title, which is Breaking the Nash Equilibrium and how we use uh, product design to create political change. Um, so about Romania, do you guys know where, what Romania is? So if you do, you're better than Lenny Kravitz, who had a concert in Romania and thought he was in Hungary. So congrats. So um, Romania is a country in, in um, Eastern Europe. And uh, I can tell you much about it, but basically uh, we were a communist country for a long time. Um, and being um, under this political regime changed a lot society, how people think and how we do politics. Mainly we do politics um, in, a, in a corrupt way by keeping, by keeping the resources captive. So after the fall of the regime in uh, 1989, um, like we had this almost 30 years of transition uh, to, to becoming a, a democracy. And uh, during this time, generations have changed. Uh, we got all connected. Um, we, we were part of the European Union, so we, we, we opened to the West. And people started to accumulate this frustration about how politics is done. Um, and so people have like a much higher pressure in, in Romania when you compare it maybe to Germany or to France to, uh, to express this frustration and to want to change things for, for themselves. Um, so to start this, uh, this unconventional journey that I, I, I'm talking about, we need to travel back in time. Um, so the year is 2015 and uh, both me and my colleague Vlad uh, just quit our uh, corporate jobs and we started working in, um, in startups in Berlin and in Amsterdam. And then uh, something happened, something, something bad happened in Romania. So I'm going to show you what happened. Uh, so I'm going to play a video of 50 seconds. So I'm warning you that um, it contains um, emotionally charged images.
Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so kind of seeing these images each, each time um, um, reminds me of how sad and, and really angry we, we, we were. Everybody was really sad and angry at, at that time. So what happened was that the fire in a, in a nightclub uh, during a heavy metal concert um, ended up killing 64 people and 146 people were, were badly injured. And this event, this tragedy was, was squarely linked with a corrupt political system, which um, kind of allowed and profited from uh, critical services like fire safety, like medical response, uh, break, breaking down and, and drowning in corruption and, and incompetence. So it was really the final shock uh, of accumulating frustration over 26 years of, of transition and many people uh, went on the streets. The prime minister resigned and somehow the political aftershocks and the demonstrations uh, continued after, like to, to, to this day actually. Um, so in this context, um, emotionally charged context, Vlad calls me and tells me we must do something. And so I paused because, um, I mean, what is something? His something was uh, proposing to change the political system. Um, and I mean, who are we to even think about that? Because we, we were already doing our best work. Um, it's also that we couldn't afford not to be paid to go and save democracy in Romania. And uh, I mean, to be honest, like, do we even know that the world needs changing? Who are we to say this? And like I said, both, both, both him and I, we were just like regular people with no revolutionary inclinations. So all these thoughts are like swirling in our heads about what should we do and should we do something? But then we also know that um, politics is actually ripe for disruption and that technology can help. And uh, we know that we are more connected and resourceful today than we were ever before in, in history. And more importantly, we know that we wanna do something. So we start thinking about how could we empower people to change the system themselves? Um, what kind of roadblocks will, will these people face? And what platform do we need to build in order, in order to help? Um, so what follows next is a typical product discovery phase. Um, so I won't bore you with, with the details, but after talking with, um, with people which were involved in politics and, and tried to reform it back home, uh, we conversed on money in politics being uh, the biggest problem. You see, um, money binds uh, parties and special interest group. Money binds uh, politicians and, and business people into a complex web um, with the potential for, for a deeply corrupting influence. Plus, politics is not cheap, um, and getting into politics actually requires money. So it means that you either have money from somewhere, or that you must be part of the actual establishment. So actually, it means that new political forces have a high barrier to, entry to, to enter the political market. So over the years, many people have tried and, and have failed, um, all but one. So you see this lady here, uh, she ran for, her name is Monica Makovey, and she ran in 2014 for the presidential election. And she had financed her com campaign with PayPal, with donations from via PayPal. But then the state uh, regulator uh, decided that this was illegal. She got um, upset and sued the state regulator. And um, she won in court. Ho however, her staff had to, uh, do like a, an immense work of gathering the paperwork to prove that those donations were real and they were coming from real citizens. So when we heard this story, uh, we kind of knew that, yeah, we have found a, pro a problem and we have something to solve. And so local elections were coming. And so we felt that this is a unique opportunity to, to, to get something done. So we had an MVP uh, up and running in seven weeks. And it was like a basic uh, platform that parties and um, um, independents uh, could use to, to receive and process uh, small donations online 
and within the letter of the law. So uh, all they had to do is put like a piece of uh, JavaScript on their site uh, and voila, the, the platform will, will guide both donors and beneficiary to this tedious process of uh, receiving the money, but also um, kind of validating the identity and all the reporting behind um, of the donors. So here is like how it looks on, on the page of, um, of on one of our partners. You can basically select the sum and follow all the steps. Um, so the reception was good. Uh, we struggled a bit, but we, we kind of get early adopters, political parties and independents um, throughout the country. Um, and some of them are actually able to run uh, for these local elections, for, so for the mayoral elections, only thanks to our platform. So I, I remember a young man in, in, in a village who was very upset about the mining project right there, uh, going on there, and he wanted to go for, for <laughs> he wanted to be the mayor, and he financed himself uh, only via, via our platform and, and run the campaign. So some won the seats, some, some didn't, but this is what, what you, would, uh, would, you would expect. So we feel like very encouraged and we start um, building features and, and, and adding features to the product. Um, however, you know, there's like one, one problem that we don't quite manage to solve. And um, this is the state regulator. So even if we build uh, the platform within the letter of the law, we still didn't get the blessing from the state regulator. And um, since they are politically appointed, if they want to make your life miserable, they can. So this was um, a, one of our biggest risks. What will the authorities say? And we didn't have any good uh, mitigation um, uh, plan in mind. Never mind, uh, we press one because we have to, because the parliamentary elections are coming in the fall. Um, so here, something really extraordinary happened that um, a political party which was barely formed, these guys, uh, the Union to Save Romania, uh, actually uh, got 9% of the national vote in the parliamentary election and uh, they, they financed themselves. So 50% of all the, the, the budget came from via our platform from the online donations. So putting in self-congratulatory terms, I think we, we had done it. We, we built a grassroots fundraising software, and in doing so, we removed a huge barrier to entry for people who, who wanted to get involved. Um, we were also like, we managed to have impact and we were also a bit profitable. Uh, so we were hoping that we were gonna pay salary for ourselves because we didn't really have for months. And then this happened. Uh, remember the state regulator? Well, they, they kind of um, did an audit on, on this big party that, that won the 9% uh, uh, seat. And uh, they decided that our platform is illegal. Uh, we, on the other hand, we tried to rally public support. We tried to explain to them how, how it works, but really nothing worked because their arguments were really convoluted and it didn't make any sense. So finally, the political party decided to sue the state regulator. But uh, as we know, um, you know, processes in court, they, they can take a long time. Um, so having a major legal risk, you know, over, over your business, um, it, it's really not great. It's not great for business. So while we had success in 2016, the, the next years were, were pretty lean. And so we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't uh, get so many, um, so many donations. Um, and then something amazing happened. Actually, the political party who sued the state regulator won in court and the court decided that our, um, our donation system is okay. And the new political party called PLUS formed. And these guys uh, started to, to work with us and, and contacted us from, from the beginning.
and actually 2019 um, got better than 2016 in terms of donations and amount. So now I want to show you something. Now I want to um, show you the political scene. So I was telling you that after the fall of the, of the, of the communist regime, somehow politics stayed the same. In a sense, this, this political party that formed these ones in, in red and, and in yellow were somehow the old politicians. And they were like creating this duopoly where they were like switching um, at the government, but they had the same type of politics, a corrupt type. And um, this lasted for 25 years. But in 2016, we see here this, this uh, blue line, um, which is basically the, the result um, in, in votes, in gathered votes of, of the new political forces, the, this, the, the union and the plus political party. So we see that in 2018, they managed to get 25% um, of, of, of the vote. So this is how political change looked like. And um, we were and we are quite happy to, to have contributed to it. Um, when we started, we had like um, a very limited understanding of, of what we were doing. Like I said, we wanted to do something. But I think over the past year, we, we developed um, a hypothesis of, of what happened here of, and what, what was our role in it. Um, so for those mathematically inclined, I think you can think of politics as a um, Nash equilibrium. So this is a situation in which um, incentives act uh, as a very strong tie to bind people to a system. And those binds work in such a way that, that people, the actors who are in the system, um, don't have really incentive to change. They, they, and they cannot afford to change the system. So everybody is like not quite happy, but also not so frustrated that they want to change the system. And then um, this in the end leads to a situation where people learn to adapt to the existing, uh, to the existing uh, system. Um, sometimes, however, in the system, uh, small pockets of, of different thinking form. Um, so in our case, this small pocket was a uh, increasingly assertive middle class that has uh, shaken off the economic dependency from the system and who was now asking for political change, who wanted to see a different kind of politics, less corrupt, and that takes them into consideration. So to them, this system was, was a, a hindrance, uh, an existential threat sometimes. So um, in our early vocabulary, it means that now because we have the pocket, this pocket, the ties to the system have been weakened, uh, but not entirely disappeared. Uh, because the freedom to act has, has increased, but their ability to change things was still lagging behind. Um, so this is because People were frustrated, but they were somehow too busy and too disorganized to act upon their frustration. Um, they were collectively in the possession of resources to make things happen, but they couldn't coordinate to make it happen. And so that lack of coordination, I think, it's, it's actually what our platform solved. So it gave disparate members of the middle class a way to sort of channel their frustration and to put their resources collectively and to make these small donations to support people among themselves who wanted to be political actors and who wanted to do a different type of politics. Um, so this means actually that right now in this newly formed equilibrium, the incentives start to change. You don't, do, uh, you don't have the same ties as in the past because you don't do politics as in the past. All of a sudden, it starts to matter the fact that you're connected to your, to your, to your grassroots donors 
the fact that you're transparent about your donations and the fact that you know you go to, to you get to do your campaign because people support you so we don't know exactly how things are gonna solidify because each equilibrium wants to stay uh, stable we're at the beginning but but we, but we think it's it's like um, a great start and we we are looking forward to see how it will happen in 2020 so in the meantime um, donations have increased so our our platform makes enough money to cover its running costs uh, we still don't pay ourselves uh, the big salaries um, but um, we're also um, you know we don't depend on anyone's kindness um, and so should we want to step out um, we can easily give this to an NGO and, and if they manage it, they could, they could make a, even a small amount of money. And so to, to come full circle, um, I, guess, I guess I wanna share with you what, we, what we've learned. Um, and I think when you think about, you know, like maybe complex system that kind of need a change and people are trying, but it's not completely there, like the healthcare, like the pollution, like the local community governance. When you think about this large system, you can, you can look at them and, and think that, yeah, these are like bad Nash equilibria. So the first step is to identify such an equilibrium. Uh, the, second, uh, the second step is to, um, find those dissatisfied actors that are most motivated to change things. Um, so you, you should start small, but not too small because you still need like a critical mass of people who are, who are unhappy and have a reason to change the system. The third step is to actually bring them uh, together on a, on a common platform, so to align their interests, because this will make them 10 times more powerful. And um, I think the last step, which is also very important, is to find a way to, to make this platform economically sustainable, because um, any solution that depends on the kindness of strangers will not really last. So um, I want to close by uh, empowering you by the, by the message I started with saying that um, you really, you don't have to be a superhero uh, to start working on, on big problems. Um, you, only, you only need to care about big problems. So if, if we could do it, and really we're like, we're just regular PNs, um, I'm pretty sure that any, any one of you can. Um, when you start a journey, I, I think what, what's important to know and what happened to us was that you don't, you don't really know the path. And so lots of time, you, it's like a lot of confusion, a lot of tension, conflict, there's disillusion, you wanna give up. Uh, so it, it can get tough. For us, um, in those moments, I think the, <laughs> the thing that saved us uh, and kept us going was the mission. The fact that we knew we wanna do something to change the politics. We knew that we wanted to create a free market of, of political projects and having this mission in mind is, is what kept us going and, and, and motivated us and also what helped us to take the best decisions uh, when, when we had to, to take one. So, um, you know, uh, don't be shy. Like I said, if you want to save the world, go ahead and keep your eyes on, on the target because you will, you, will, you will make progress. So that's, that's all. Thank you. All right, so you have one from uh, Livio, our first speaker. How uh, did people find out about you? Oh, uh, so yeah, these people here, these early adopters. Yeah, we actually took a car and um, I mean, we already had some connections because we, uh, at the beginning, we talked with lots of politicians, like, what do we need to do? What's your biggest problem? What's, why, why is the system so bad? And so uh, these people gave us some contacts. So we went and, and visited them. 
And we also like took the car and kind of traveled the, the country to go and, and talk with this um, independent candidates and, and new political forces and, and present our solutions. Today, we don't need to do this anymore because everybody knows that we exist and everybody who's like starting a, a new party or plans to go to run for, for election um, kind of writes us or calls us. Thank you. And well, we have a lot of um, people being inspired by your talk. Uh, and we have still a few questions uh, from Marfisa. How did the, how, so you two, wait, the question, um, who did the development part? Or, or the question is more like, did you do the PM part and or yeah, the I development part? I don't know how to code. Uh, so uh, Vlad, my colleague, did most of the development part uh, during uh, many nights and days. And we also had people who helped us at the beginning. So friends, uh, developer who could code, designer, um, a market, uh, a person on marketing. So we had some, some volunteers who, who helped us uh, at the beginning. Cool, and another one from Livio. Can you share your tips on how to make a platform like this sustainable? Um, so it, it, is, um, it is in the volume of donations, right? So it, and somehow we, we take, a, in order to make it sustainable, we take a 5% cut of, uh, of, of each donation. And so we, we get to pay the, the payment processor and we also get to pay all the, all the fees uh, and, and maintenance uh, with the platform. But essentially we are, we are dependent on the success of, of uh, small donations online. Cool, and uh, one from Ben. Uh, he's interested uh, whether you have any ideas about what or could or should be done in countries like France or Germany? Uh, that's a very uh, large question. I think, I think, I mean, one of the fundamental idea I, I like about what, what we did is that somehow you bring people and politicians um, closer together, right? Because you can make donations to the politician you like, which means that he needs to communicate with you. He needs to know you. He needs, he needs to know your problems. He, he needs to know how to represent this problem. But you can also make donations for political projects. So politicians and political parties, they can come up with projects which are relevant for, for you at the community level or at the national level, and you get to, to, to support this. And so I think, you know, like shrinking these feedback loops is, uh, is, is a great idea that could also apply in, this, in these countries. Like, how do we make sure not to wait four years to, to give our voice? How do we make sure to be more in contact and more in control of what politicians actually do? Thank you. One from uh, Samrat uh, Bose. If you have to reflect back on things you would uh, approach differently, what would be the most impactful change that you would initiate? So reflecting back, what would be the most impactful change that you would uh, initiate? If you were to do things differently. Yes, that's, um, that's a very good question. I think, um, I think one of the questions I have in my mind is about uh, involvement, you know, like at the beginning we were 100% involved for many months and, and trying to set it up. But then, like I showed you, like these bad years where basically uh, there were no donations, it started to become financially very difficult for us. And so, um, now we have our jobs and, and we do this still as, as a side project, but I do ask myself, you know, 
what's the good what's the good measure of actually getting involved what if i what if we go full time again like how how much could we actually build of, of this product so that's um uh, that's something that i reflect on and i still didn't find the answer I think these are the questions uh, so far. Um, so thanks a lot, uh, Anna Maria and Livio. Uh, and now we'll do five more minutes uh, of the breakout rooms you've experienced earlier. And I'm going to recreate them so that you may get with other people. And then in five minutes, we see uh, all of us here again. Um, you think about furnishing your house tomorrow or getting something in your house tomorrow. What's the one company that comes to your mind or, or the one place that you would go and look for that? And, and many people will reply with Ikea. Uh, oh, so they, they, really... they have been, they have been yeah, tremendously, tremendously successful designing like the whole, the whole experience end to end and really like adding all this other, this other aspects beyond like just the core job, you know, like I need to get some cheap furniture to like, you know, you, how they, they let you sneak through all the, the lower, the lower part with all the cheap stuff and then like all the, the food stuff. Yeah. They've really, they've really done a tremendous job there. Yeah. And then they upsell you on, on some of these random stuff, which would be 30 cents, but it's uh, four euros on their end. Yeah. They, they, um, but, but in end to end, it's a great product. Uh, it is, if you it is. judge it from this perspective, it's even we, if I mean, we kind of have this love hate uh, relationship with it. Yeah, I mean, their, their product is the retail experience in the end. Oh. So uh, it seems like we have um, uh, probably uh, fewer than uh, 10 people kind of quit because one of my breakout room was also uh, heading out. Um, Ben here may be a potential speaker for one of our next events. Uh, so that's why we were uh, in the breakout room and uh, chatting. So, so thanks everyone for participating. Again, uh, Livio and uh, Ana Maria, thank you for your talks. Um, Steffi, thanks for co-organizing uh, with us and um, take, uh, taking a look in the rooms and uh, setting up the infrastructure. Uh, Yana as well. Um, Anil, as always, uh, so thanks a lot and see you at the next one, uh, which is on the 26th. We have a PM from Tinder uh, joining us from LA, so it would be morning for her over there. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.